Okay, a little tales from the couch for you. Uh, we're going to do two games and really spend a lot of time on the headliner, and that's Minnesota at Denver. Uh, not only a preview of what could happen in the playoffs, but more importantly, at least right now, because I still think seeding matters. I think seeding really matters if Denver can get a home game, a game seven in the Western Conference Finals. Uh, I would think that's something that you wanna, don't want to do. And the way Denver had the West last year, it's just different. Like They've got to play strong the rest of the way. We'll talk about the schedules. I don't know that we're going to get super into matchups because this stuff could change just in a matter of 48 hours. So um, the biggest thing that I look for when Denver's playing Minnesota is just kind of how both coaches work the jokic Nas matchup along with Rudy Gobert and Aaron Gordon. So if you look at this, the original assignment, the way this game will start, is that they want Nas Reed on Jokic. And they want Rudy Gobert on Aaron Gordon. And this is good for Minnesota because Minnesota can use Ru Rudy as somebody who's going to float. Now, if Gordon wants to play in the perimeter to try to grab Rudy away from the basket, then Minnesota's going to live with that. Be like, all right, fine, Aaron, go ahead and take shots. A shot from the perimeter from Aaron Gordon is a win for Minnesota. One, because Gordon's not shooting well this year. It's not really who he is. Uh, number two, it's a shot that Jokic or Murray are not taking. Um, and one of the best parts about Denver's offense this year against most teams is that Gordon runs the baseline in that dunker spot. So whenever the help comes to Jokic, then Gordon's eating for free. I would point you to the Gordon game that he had against Boston, the one in Denver, where you're like, okay, well, you have to figure out a way to recover, but it's just hard to recover when you don't have that size if your big guy is already on Jokic. But in this case, the second biggest guy is on Jokic. Rui's left to kind of flow. Now, when I think about defensively, like of the floating big, Rob Williams, when he was with Boston, they put up these terrific defensive numbers, but it was very much based on like Rob Williams' assignment. If it was a non shooting four, then they'd be like, go ahead, just like Aaron Gordon, like, go ahead, do whatever you want. And then we're going to let Rob Williams come to the rim and crash and deflect shots and all these different things. Like, Rob Williams is not as good of a defensive player as Rudy Gobert is, but he was really good at that thing. And in this matchup, it's almost allowing Gobert to be like, hey, you get to just kind of come and help. And I think it's a lot easier as the second defender actually to play defense because you're not on the man with the ball. You're not worried about, especially with somebody like Jokic, the toolbox of skills that he has at getting free right around the rim. You can just sort of wait until the shot goes up. So what I look for is the substitution patterns on how Mike Malone wants to get Gordon in there or out of there. And I think last night was really telling with this. So when you look at Gordon's numbers in his four games against Minnesota, he's averaging 9.3 points per game. It's his third lowest points per game against any NBA team this season. He was subbed out at 531. Um, and then Minnesota actually brought Nas out as well. And if you look at him coming out, Gordon at 531, he averages nine minutes a game in the first quarter. All right. So we can get into substitution patterns, which most teams are pretty rigid on this kind of stuff, unless the game itself, like it, it dictates or foul trouble, that kind of stuff. So then you have Rudy on Jokic and you could see when it was just those two, Jokic doesn't really have any fear uh, at going at Rudy one on one. I'm not saying it's easy, but he's not deterred at all. Uh, Minnesota actually closed with Kyle Anderson on Jokic. Uh, in the first quarter. And again, the Nas foul trouble probably played into some of this where maybe Minnesota would have used him a little bit more straight up on him. But the reason he's in foul trouble, granted, it's just Jokic, it's that tough. Um, I think the most important thing on the Gordon sub stuff, and we'll move on from this, I promise, is that Gordon was subbed out at 731 of the fourth quarter. He never came back in. And that's when Denver's offense started to look like Denver's offense again. You know, watching Denver run away from Minnesota in the fourth quarter, just surgical in that fourth quarter. We'll get some of those plays. Uh, I don't know that it was just because Gordon wasn't out there, but it was it's a combination of a lot of different factors. I mean, it turned into a dunk contest at one point there for the Nuggets, but we've seen the Nuggets throughout the entire season be like, OK, it's go time. This game is over. But to do it against Minnesota, who I thought did a really good job in the first half where the game's close at the half, uh, it's 52-49 Minnesota at the half, but it felt like it was kind of a clunky offensive half for the Nuggets. It didn't, it didn't look the way the Nuggets are supposed to look, and that's a credit to Minnesota as the best defensive team in the league. So the other matchup would be Jaden against Murray, and... It's just not the freedom, the level of freedom that we're used to seeing with Murray have on offense, where he can kind of dribble and get into his stuff. Because um, McDaniels is going to pick him up as, as 
you know, as tight as he can. That's why he gets in foul trouble because he's so aggressive on the ball. But I think it's probably worth it. You could get into the debate of, you know, how smart some of the fouls are. Uh, and I think it'd be fair criticism there. Also, the overall factor of like how soon the opponent's getting into the bonus if he's taking some bad fouls there. But I think you take that with him because he's just so aggressive and he's fighting the entire time. It's not like Murray gets shut down. I mean, he had 20 last night when they got it going with he and Jokic uh, when they were pulling away in this game. It started to look more like Denver's offense, but he was 8 of 13, but he didn't take any free throws last night. So a lot of the Denver work to get Murray free is like you almost have to set two screens because Jaden's going to fight through the first one, or if you don't get a good angle on it, he's clear. Like There was a lot of stuff they were doing with Murray where it was like, all right, they, they have to set a couple screens here just to try to get him free. Um, fourth quarter, as I mentioned, surgery, 88-87 with 8.46 to go. Then six minutes later, it's 110-94. Um, Christian Brown had a dunk on Rudy that was just nuts. I mean, he goes up, looks like he wants to go to his right hand, He's on the left side, so to then get clear of it and hope he can not get it blocked, he finishes with his left hand. He had another dunk in there that was sick. Peyton Watson's activity, I don't know if he's going to be a star, but the way he's coming in and impacting these games with his defense and his energy, and there's still, you can see he wants a little bit more offense or a little bit more freedom. He's just a freak out there, man. It's awesome, and it's, uh, it's a credit to Denver's front office for finding somebody that you're like, you know what? Because if you looked at like some of his summer league stuff, you go, okay, there's there's way more offense in there, but there's just not a room. There's just not enough room in an NBA game for the five guys all to get to do what they want to do on offense. Those are the tanking teams. But Watson, in a limited version of him, because I, I wonder if there's this other version of him that will exist. I just loved his game last night. But Brown gets the dunk on Rudy. A question about Christian Brown. Does he look like a guy you would go to summer camp with that would lie about his father having a helicopter? All right. A couple numbers here that I actually found a little surprising because you can very simply go, well, that's Minnesota. They struggled again, late offense. And I do think it's a, a real thing that I'm going to worry about in the playoffs. And that's why, you know, Cat, at least allows you this other offensive option that's super efficient that another team has to game plan differently for. But the way they've survived is that Nas Reed has been incredible <laughs> this this whole run. So when you look at their records and you look at their number post cat, you're like, wait, there wasn't really that much of a fall off. Does that like we could have a cat debate? We've already heard my version of the whole thing. Um but Here's what surprised me a bit. I was looking at the fourth quarter offensive and defensive efficiency numbers for the league post All Star break. You know who has the number one offense in the fourth quarter after the All Star break? Minnesota. You know who has the number one defense? Denver. So if we look at the field goal attempts for Jokic, depending on the defensive assignments, Nas uh, of his 20 field goals, six were against Nas, eight were against Rudy, uh, five were against Kyle Anderson, and then Luke Garza there at the very end. Let's talk a little bit about Ant. He had zero points in the fourth quarter, went zero for three after 15, I believe, in the third quarter. And it was Christian Brown on him. But it wasn't like Denver just said, okay, we have to stop Ant. Let's blow up our rules and stop Ant. It was just very passive from Edwards. And I know what you're saying, Minnesota fans. Don't worry, we'll get there. Um, there was, I went back and watched the possessions this morning. I was standing in the corner, um, action running on the opposite side of him, not in the play. There's another play where like it gets he swings it. It was the right basketball play, so he swings it. Somebody else they missed three. Uh, I felt like some of the guys went early uh, instead of him. He just wasn't really aggressive. They ran him. They had Edwards bring it up. They ran horns. He switches into a Murray three where you know Murray wasn't up on him. So it's like okay, this is open, but it just wasn't very aggressive. He had one layup where he drove kind of one on three. It was really tough to even pull it off, and that's when they called the foul and then overturned it. So it just was slow. It wasn't necessarily this incredible design by Denver to like face guard him off the ball or double him on everything and then force the ball out of his hands. He just wasn't really aggressive. And I know what you're saying for some of you. Hey, he had 51 two nights ago against Washington, and maybe they shouldn't have played him that many minutes. I think he played 38. They got into Denver at 1 a.m. after that game because that game was in Minnesota. And that's the whole reason Like I just hate the default. You've heard me say this. I hate the default 
Well, it was back to back. Okay. All right. But, you know, that game kind of played out the way I think a lot of us feel about the West as deep and as unpredictable as the West may feel like. Denver just dismantled them in six minutes on offense against a defensive team that just looks terrific. And look, there were a few moments there where we didn't see enough of it with Jokic and Murray, where, you know, they got Rudy into a spot where he's kind of playing two on one. They get enough people out of the action where now it's Murray with the ball and Jokic. It's very simple, but it's incredibly effective. Hey, just keep going towards the rim. So Rudy has to think about you on the other side of the lane as Murray is coming down one side with the ball in his hands. Murray hit a floater on one. Then they ran it again. Uh, it was out of bounds. It was Denver's basketball. Uh, and then Jokic put a spin move on Gobert that was just filthy. So if we look at the West, Denver is now one game up on OKC in Minnesota. So that's the one, two, and three seed right now. Denver finishes at San Antonio at Memphis. Uh, you'd expect that that's not going to be the hardest thing. OKC's home against Milwaukee and Dallas. And then Minnesota is home against Atlanta with Trey Young back for the first game last night since February 23rd and then Phoenix. So I don't know what kind of jockeying that we're going to see there at the very end. Speaking of the rest of the West, uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time on Dallas because they just destroyed Miami in the first half. Miami did make a push there late. And Dallas closed the door on them. That was so impressive from Dallas. And I know Miami didn't have Rozier and they didn't have Duncan Robinson, but I've actually liked Miami better after the All Star break uh, than I did before. But you never really know what to do with them. Are they just coasting? It doesn't really matter. I thought that game kind of mattered for Miami, and Dallas looked like a complete level above them. Uh, when I say everything worked, I think Kyrie and Luca had 40 combined in the first half. The defensive rotations. The effort, just simple stuff like, hey, a guy has a catch at the rim. He's not my guy. You know, Kleba's walled up. Gafford's walled up. So let me just reach in. The deflections, and then if Dallas wants to go fast, they go fast and get it right up at the court and get a really easy shot. I'll never understand why teams don't at least want to off a miss, push the ball, see if you get a nice, you know, after the break three. Um, you know, there's just open shots out there waiting waiting for you take them take their money uh i don't understand why there's teams that just were like nope let me let me just some of the point guards that drive me crazy where it's like all right i want the defensive rebound pass it to me every time so i can stop what we're doing and then make sure i get it in high pick and roll and then that way i can decide if i want to take a shot or if i get an assist so everybody thinks like i'm this awesome team player because i have a ton of assists i i don't understand doing that like and if Dallas wants to run the half court, they're going to do that to you. And now you can't sell out and double against Luca the way other teams have in the past because Kyrie's absolutely cooking. And then Gafford, who apparently just doesn't miss any shots anymore, with two absurd field goal make streaks that he's had this season. So it's it's tough to watch them and not be like, God, like am I gonna am I gonna get dangerous here with my? I wonder if anybody's if Dallas, you know, continues. At, like we only have a couple games to go here before the regular season is over. I wonder how many people may actually pick Dallas to win the West. Uh, I'm not there. I, I'm, you know, look, this isn't breaking news. I'm just going to pick Denver again. I think I would have picked Denver again, even if Minnesota got them last night. And that season series it, is a two apiece. And even if Minnesota, you'd be going, oh, they'd won last night. They're up three one. They've got Denver's number. We saw it last year with the injuries and the guys that were out last year in the playoff series. Even though it went to five games, I feel like Minnesota gets so much credit for that five game series. Uh, in the annals of NBA history. So we've covered Dallas. I mean, a couple more numbers here. Last, the last 15 games, Dallas is 13 and two, number one defense in the league. Rebounding rate is up. They're eighth in pace, they're fifth in shooting. They just check a lot of ba boxes. And even when Miami would try to sell out against Luka, it's just he's so big. It's like, oh, cool. You're going to double team me to the sideline 30 feet away from the hoop. All right, cool. I'll just back up here a little bit and then I'm going to throw a pass right over the top of you, and now it's four on three. Uh, it's going to be a lot. I do not envy the coaches trying to figure out defensively like what they think they can go to there. And Kyrie's a little bit more locked in defensively. Jimmy Butler came into the game. Fourth quarter, you're like, all right, is Jimmy Butler going to get it going here? Nope. One field goal attempt in the fourth. Uh, he came in. They immediately were looking for Kyrie. They were hunting him. They switched to Butler into him two or three times right away, and then Butler was like, nah, I'm good. 
this game's over. I'm not super into it. Butler's not a huge field goal attempt per game guy. I mean, he's 13 for his career. You know, sometimes he'll sneak up a few beyond that, but he's he's never been like an 18 or 20 shot guy with a team. And part of that is offset by how many free throws he always takes. He's always at like seven or eight because he's just really good at doing it. Remember, we tell you on this advanced scouting with Butler, don't go for the extra up fake that he gives you that other players don't give you. Uh, and that's just a huge part of his game. But he just wasn't super engaged. I keep kind of waiting to see him take over. Maybe we're all going to have to wait for the play-in, playoff, whatever. Uh, I do wonder if 76ers fans' blogs are jealous of the irrational MVP Luka push right now, where it's just really shitty. Luka, look, he's... He's been awesome. A vote for Jokic is not a bad vote, Dallas fans. It's okay. But that's not what they're going to do. That's not what we do around here. Uh, and then Dallas, with this with this run, I don't think anyone's going to pick the Clippers if that's your final matchup, which it likely is going to be. Will anyone pick the Clippers? Or, and I have this just thing in my head where I'm like, will the Clippers just trick everybody? Like, okay, we know what we can do. We're good. And it depends on health. Because we're already seeing whether it's the Giannis injury. And I may do this next week, just going through like the last 10 years, because it's basically like two major injuries that derail a couple teams and sometimes derail what our preconceived notions were about who's going to win either the East or the West. And the Giannis part of it is really scary for Milwaukee. And the Clippers, like, you never know. You could be just like, hey, game one. Oh, yeah, two guys are actually out. <laughs> like, wait, what? But I don't think it'll matter. I think a fully healthy Clippers with how great Dallas has looked and how they're going to close this season, I don't know if anybody's going to pick the Clippers, at least on the national front. 